Sunday, we kicked off this new series called Reposition. Everybody say Reposition. And there were some thoughts that I spoke of um, in the message that, um, that I want to just kind of piggyback tonight. I'm not going to repeat myself, don't worry. Um, but it, it, is going to, it is going to challenge us. Um, and, and here's why I came up with this message today. It's called Altars. And, uh, and all of us have altars that we create, whether they're healthy altars or destructive altars. Every single one of us. And one of the things that I notice with Christianity today, and if you were here Sunday, how many were here su- Sunday? Awesome, good for you. You guys are the diehard Wednesday nighters, huh? I love it. Um, but I noticed that, that, and it happens to, it can happen to any of us here, where, you know, your Christianity can become so stale, but we put the pressure on someone else to keep it alive. When in all reality, it is our responsibility to keep our faith high, right? And uh, it's our responsibility to keep uh, not only our faith high, but to keep this passion uh, for this pursuit of a living God, right? Our pursuit for Jesus to be something that that we make something meaningful. If not, then we're going to we're going to trade in um, the cross of what Jesus did for us for a fashion Christianity. And, and, and I think you're seeing that in our culture today. There's too much fashionistas in the body of Christ. We're looking for a fashion of gospel. And if you read your Bible, let me tell you, there's nothing fashionable about it. It's powerful, I'll tell you that much. But I, I want us to uh, think about, instead of, because I was like, okay, do I call it, you know, embrace your faith? I'm like, okay, that sounds too, too typical. You know, I've already did a whole series on faith. I'm like, but how can I say this without you guys thinking, like, okay, embrace your faith. And that thought, altars. Think about it. Every single person in the Bible that was leading something or leading their family, leading, leading a movement, creating a revival, every single one of them were responsible to build God an altar. Every single one of them. And so I want to start with this verse, Exodus chapter 20. If you have your Bibles with you, your iPads, whatever you use for a Bible, I want you to go there and open it and uh, look at it. And uh, if not, it will also be on the screen. But let's start in verse 24 and 25. It says this. It says, make an altar out of dirt for me. Who do we make altars for? This isn't a trick question. Who do we make altars for? For who? God. Is it for you? Don't we like creating altars for ourselves a lot? Called idols? But now, now listen, I'm going to explain what, what the real meaning of altars are in a minute. But I also want you to think about this. Another meaning that we can take this word altar and also place it in our life, how we alter our personal life. In other words, we alter our faith to what we want, not what God said. We can alter our, our mission, our plan, our purpose. And, and, and that word alter, another word for it is, it's kind of like when you take, have you ever taken your clothes to get altered, right? You were trying to change the height, the length, the width, whatever it is. And you want to alter it. Well, that's what happens with us as well. We tend to alter God's plan for our life. And then we start creating this whole you know, dysfunction in our personal life, and, and those become the, the wrong altars. We want to create altars that are being built for who? For him. So he says this. He says, make an altar out of dirt for me. Sacrifice. Everybody say sacrifice. Look at your neighbor and say, we have to sacrifice. It's another cuss word in the church. If it ain't, if it ain't yield... It's sacrifice. Everybody wants what they want until they have to sacrifice for it. He says, sacrifice your burnt offerings and friendship offerings on it. Sacrifice your sheep, your goats, your cattle on it. How about this? Sacrifice your pride, your ego, your doubt, your fear. Your unbelief, 
sacrifice those. Give those to God. Not just that stuff. How about let's sacrifice our gifts, our talents. Let's sacrifice our generosity. Just saying. Because I'm sure no one has sheep, goats, cattle. And look, and look, 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 look. He says, I will come to you. When you learn to sacrifice, he will come to you. When you learn to live a sacrifice life for Jesus, he will not only come to you, I will come to you and I will bless you. I will bless you in some places of your life. He will bless you where? Everywhere. How would you like to walk in everywhere and be blessed? You go to the work, you're blessed. But guess what? Only people who sacrifice at work are blessed. Huh? We just want the blessing but don't want the sacrifice. God's like, no, you bring me your sacrifice and you watch me bless your socks off. And if you don't have any socks, I'll put socks on. <laughs> he says, I'll bless you everywhere. I cause my name to be what? So think about it. Whatever altar you create, you honor or dishonor God. If you make an altar out of the stones to honor me, do not build it with blocks of what? Stone. You will make it unclean if you use a tool on it. In other words, if you take the whole context of the verse and, and he says, okay, build me an altar, but don't, don't you dare be bringing me no cut stones. You would think that the sacrifice would be the cutting of the stones, but he calls the cutting of the stones, he called that unclean. It's not pure. So you know what he, he expected the children of Israel to do whenever they built these altars? They would have to literally go find rocks and have to match it with other rocks to be able to fit the shape of the next rock they were going to pile. And that's, so that took work. You had to be walking the desert to find another rock, carry the rock back, and see if it fits the other rock you already carried and make sure that it fits together. Sacrifice. Because it's easier just to find any rock and just start chiseling that bad boy. That's too close. God's like, no, I'm an extra mile God. I want you to set, I want this altar to mean something to you. I want you to bring me something that says, Father God, what I'm doing with my life, what I'm giving of my life, it means something to you. It's for you. That's why when he says, and when you work, he says, do it heartily unto who? God. For it is he whom you serve. But we serve, we serve with an expectation of something in return. But God says, no, I want you to serve as if you were serving me. Are you here tonight? Okay. So we have to sacrifice. Say that word sacrifice. So God had them build altars. Why altars? Well, he had them build altars because in those times, you know, obviously they, they had the Torah. Not everybody had access to the Torah, right? You know, we have the Bible. We all have access to the Bible, but we don't use it very much in our culture, right? Right? They had no Bible. They had nothing there for them. You know, they had to wait for the priest to come and then share a word or a prophet to come and then speak a prophetic word over them. That's the only word they got, right? And so what they did is they had this personal experience with God. Every single person had a personal experience. with. They had meaning to their faith. They had meaning to their walk. They had a meaning to this lifestyle of pursuing God. Um, and so when these people built altars, the purpose was for their children and their children's children's children to one day walk by those altars and say, hey, what's that? And then they'd be like, oh, that's where your father Abraham built an altar. See, every single altar that was built in, in the time of the Israelites, right, every single one, you just think about Abraham. When Abraham was going to his promised land, 
Remember that verse where he said, and, and Abraham obeyed God and he went, not knowing where he was going, there was meaning. And all throughout the course of that journey, he built God one altar, two altars, three, all throughout his journey. Why? Because later on, Abraham's children of faith would walk by and be like, oh my God, wow, this is where Abraham, the altars that the men and women of God built for God was a symbol of where God met them, was a symbol of where God did something. It was, it, let's take the children of Israel. Remember when the Israelites came out of Egypt? And you remember there was a time where they, they crossed the Jordan? Do you guys remember that? What did God do at the Jordan? Ellie, how's your Bible? Okay. Wow. What, what did they do at the Jordan? They, good job. Two syllables. He, he split. This. Yeah, good. Awesome job. Great job. He Listen, he split the Jordan. They walked through it. And what did they build on the other side? An altar. So that the people of God, their children's 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 children, every single time they walked by that Jordan, they remembered that that was the place where God said, I'm about to own this land for you. I'm a... I'm about to do something right here for you. And so it was a sacrifice. It's a beautiful thing when you think about, uh, you know, an altar. An altar is also a place that we create for generations. It's not just for you. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, but an, also, a, an altar also represented a place of spiritual warfare. Like what we did tonight, that was an altar. During worship, while we started praying against the works of the enemy, the defeated foe, the devil, when we started praying that no weapon, for, we, we were creating an altar. We're saying, uh uh, not, not today. No, it's not going when you, to. When you put your thought into, I'm praying tonight with a divine purpose, I'm praying like I know God's moving right now behind, I'm in church. And anything that I was experiencing outside of church right now, God's already working behind the scenes. Like you're creating that kind of altar. Whether, listen, whether you, you believe it right now or not, whether the circumstance changes or not, God is on the move. And so it's a place for generations. Um, and of course, what they would do too is there were so many beliefs in, in their times, right? They, you always had like King Nebuchadnezzar. You had all these wicked kings that would build their shrines and, and they, would, they would, you know, they had a different uh, deity of like what their faith was and what their shrines, what their altars looked like. And so what the children of Israel would do is they would go and they would literally destroy the, the altars of false gods and then they would build an altar of God over that bad boy. How about that? What if you started building an altar over your pain? Huh? What if you started building an altar in that workplace you hate? Huh? I wonder what God would do. And so they would literally wipe out any false altars, false gods, false idols, and they would tear them down, and they would go ahead, and they would say, we are creating this altar for, for Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi. Don't get me started now. All the Jehovah's. Huh? Jeez, we're, we're, man, we are crazy. This altar will be sanctified for Jesus Christ. That's why you take Halloween night. We are taking and we're building an altar on the most darkest night saying this is an altar for souls. Amen? It's an altar for Jesus. It's an altar for people to come and experience the love of God. When you start thinking it like that biblically, you start like, okay, man, I better get over my, my little religious spirit. Because that may be my own idol. Your ideas can be your own idol. Your ideas can be your own shrine. Your ideas can be your own God. Right? Whether it's fear or faith. It, it, it happens. And so they would tear down these false idols, tear down all the false gods, and they would go ahead and just consecrate an altar for God. And it was amazing. I mean, you just think story after story uh, and for sake of time, because I, I can go, I can turn this into a series, honestly. But you just think about, remember when Jesus met the girl at the well? 
Remember that girl? And, uh, and he's like, hey, girl, give me a drink. And she's like, can you know, drink. That's where, that's where it all started for, you know, women just kind of just changed their attitude, just got all, I, I ain't getting no drink. You go get your own water, you know. That's what happened right there. And Jews like, hey, but, you know, Jesus gave us, the men, the power to say, girl, if you only knew who was asking you to go get me a drink. <laughs> yeah. You would thirst again, girl. Oh, but I give you everlasting, you know, you got that whole thing. So, but think about it. Think about it. What was the name of the well? Jacob's well. She said to Jesus, do you know? Because he said, I'll give, you, I'll give you water where you will never thirst again. And she said, where, where, where do you get this kind of stuff? Do you realize that the, the water, we, this well is where the animals of Jacob drank. He drank out of this, it, what was it? It was an altar. Isn't it amazing how Jesus shows up to an altar? And a girl starts talking about that altar. Why? She was talking about her forefathers. There was someone great. Jacob, was Jacob, was Jacob always amazing in his life? What was his name for a minute? Deceiver, right? Then what did God change his name to? Israel, right? And so all of us will experience moments in our life that will be painful, hurtful, uh, moments of, of setbacks, but regardless, we have an opportunity to create something that leaves something for someone to say, do you know who, do you know who created this altar? Do you know who built this bad boy? It's significant. Your worship should be significant. When you show up here on Wednesdays or Sundays, you don't, now if you're coming late, I get Wednesdays, I, I totally understand Wednesdays. People come late from work and I get that. Sundays, I don't get it. I don't understand it. How do you walk in late to worship? but you won't walk in late to a movie theater. We want popcorn. You know, we want Coca-Cola, extra ice, huh? You know, you want your, your Twizzlers. You know, you, hey, who wants to miss the previews? Heck to the no, I got to see the previews. I got to see the previews. The church is more faithful to the movie theater than they are to God. But we treat worship like, okay, yeah, it's just a song. No, it's an altar. I'm creating a moment of an altar from the stage to the seats. Amen? Driving your car here is an altar. I'm driving my butt to church. Amen? Anyways, don't get upset at me. Okay, so there are, I have to, I have, we're at 8 o'clock, we got to go. Hurry up. Ready? So there's, there's five altars I want to talk about that we are all going to have to build through this life. Nobody gets away with this. Are you guys ready? All right, altar number one. We have to build altars in moments of transition or change, whatever, whatever word you like better. Um, every single one of us live a life of seasons of change, seasons of newness of life, seasons of different things that we all experience. Every single one of us, we all go through things. For example, um, I can remember a time where um, where I was in, in the midst of changing my career from a place of, of working in the workforce and then God was calling me into the full-time ministry. And that was an amazing, amazing experience and change in my life. I super loved it. I, I was like, wow, amazing. At first, of course, it was kind of challenging because I was thinking like, do I really want to do this? And there was that internal struggle. But it was so amazing to, um, to experience that, that change of my life because I got so used to working in the workforce. I'm like, man, how does this ministry, that just doesn't, it's not something I wanted. It's not something I was believing for. And, um, and so I went ahead and went for it. And I can tell you this, it wasn't an easy one because I have never done ministry for one, uh, never been to theology school, 
uh, Bible school, any kind of school. So it was literally walking in and just having to figure out. And then there was no uh, training manuals in the church. There were no, there was no, like, training. There was nothing. There was not. It was like, okay, we hired you. Go. <laughs> and I felt like Abraham. And I went and knew not where I was going. And I learned by trial and error. But I'll tell you, I never regret that, that moment of change of my life that pushed me to start creating things for God that people would literally be blessed by that were implemented. And then here we, you know, that was, that was back in December 96. And then when I moved on, that was 14 years later in the church when we, 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 we left and started Elevate Church, it's amazing to see the complete transition from 100 people to, I guess we were running probably like maybe close to 4,000 people by then. And we started with 100 people, but it was all systems and structure and discipleship and loving on people and serving people and serving the community. And, and these were all things that did not exist. And, and I don't know where you're at right now. Maybe you're in a transition of career. And it's not easy because you've been doing your career for like 100 years. You know what I'm saying? And you're probably thinking, I'm too old to change. I'm too old to shift. I'm too old to transition into a whole new city. I don't know if I can do it. I'm not smart enough. I don't have the education background to, to validate that I should make this change. I don't know. Maybe you're in transition in a relationship. Maybe you're in a transition uh, in, in your faith. Maybe you're going from being a doubter to saying, you know what? I need to start working on my faith, believing God. Trusting God. And we all hit these places of where we're going through some form of transition. And as I was just thinking about this, I remember even coming to Elevate Church was the most hard thing. Like, I can remember the altar of my transition here because before this church opened, there was a bench. I don't even know if the bench is still there. I think it's still there. Right across the street right here. If you walk out, make a left. Right on the corner of 8th and Main. I'll never forget it. Right before we open, I'm like, this is horrible. I'm like, there's just, I think I miss God. I, maybe, it was, it was all, maybe it was all my head. I must have came up with this stupid idea, you know. And I just started just my, racking my head of like, oh, my God, we're not, now we, I don't have a job. Uh, we have no income coming in. Uh, we're in a community that, oh, my God, is so poverty-minded. My that was nine years ago. Not now anymore. It's changed. But poverty-minded, uh, everybody wanted something from us, didn't want to give anything to us. And, uh, and I'm just thinking, this is, this is, this is horrible. And, and I was having a moment of complete feeling like this was the most stupidest thing, decision I ever made in my life. And listen, God is so, when you're pursuing God, God knows how to get a hold of you. Do you realize that God uses our phones as well. He had somebody call me. They didn't even attend our church. They, they were someone that we were doing business with for marketing, like printing flyers or something like that. And he's a Christian. And he called me when I was having that moment on that bench right there. I was angry, disappointed, man, disillusioned, like what the heck. And this guy calls me and says, hey, God put it on my heart to call you. And I'm like, are you serious? And this guy just starts praying for me, encouraging me, reminding me why we exist in New Hall, reminding me what God had spoken to me. God had shared with him the whole story of how this whole church started. And, uh, and he just kept pushing me. And, and listen, by the time I got done with that phone call, once I hung up, man, there was an altar of prayer right there. And I just started saying, Father, I thank you that you are going to see us through this. You gave us this vision. It was your idea. I had to start reminding myself and remind him what he said and not what I was thinking. Amen? And that just became the most amazing uh, transition of, of awesome change. And, uh, and, and, and I love that because when I got up off that chair, I felt boldness now. I felt courage. And I felt like we can do this thing. And then, of course, and then I came back and had moments of like, what the heck are we doing? You know, especially after preaching Sunday, I'm like, okay, I finally did it. Because I didn't preach very often at where I come from. It was like maybe a couple times a year. Try, try preaching twice a year and then I'll preach every Sunday. That's hard. 
So I would conquer one Sunday and then be all excited. And then by Sunday night, I'd be stressed out because I knew that Sunday was coming again. <laughs> so it was a week of hell. And I had to do it all over again. I literally felt like uh, Groundhog Day. Like literally, it's just like this is never any. It's horrible. It's just like it's stressful, man. It's just until, listen, unless you're, unless you're a communicator speaker, uh, you wouldn't understand it. But try, try coming on the stage and bring a sermon every Sunday, and you're being graded by the, by the congregation, too. Just, just throwing that little note there. Like, okay, he did okay this week. Yeah. Okay. And then there, there's the moments of, 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 of altars where we have to bring reality back to our life and truth. What do I mean by that? Uh, this is an altar that we all have to think about. Do you guys remember the story of the prodigal son? Okay. The prodigal son, just to understand the, the Jewish tradition of how inheritances worked. In order for a father to give an inheritance to a child, the father had to be dead, right? That's like the given, like duh. But beyond that, any time uh, the process of an inheritance was that you would have to go personally and bury your father before you received your inheritance. So the prodigal son goes to his father and says, give me my inheritance. He's, he was under a house of believers. His father was godly. He was God-fearing. But within that house was not only the prodigal son. He also had a brother. So I want you to talk, I just want you to think, of, you can literally be in the father's house and be thinking all kinds of stupid things and still be sitting hearing every message and be so twisted, whether you're someone that just wants to literally walk away from God and go do your thing, or you're in the house pretending you're right with God when you have a poisoned heart or a bitter heart, a resentful heart, an unforgiving heart. And I'll explain them both. So the prodigal son then says, Dad, give me my monies. And the dad, the father, was hurt because he knew that that meant that his son saw him as, you're dead to me. You're dead to me. And the father, being so gracious and so humble, he gave him all of his inheritance. I think that the God the father does the same with us, doesn't he? He lets us have what we want even at his own hurt because he'll never cross your will. What does he do with the money? Spends it on hookers. Is that a strong word? <laughs> Some of you cuss, I don't know. <laughs> um, hookers, prostitutes. <laughs> Heathen stuff, how's that? Is that better? <laughs> Dirty stuff. <laughs> Perversion. Drinking up a storm, partying up a storm. Come on, he's living the grand life, doesn't care about his family, doesn't care about his father, doesn't care about his mother, doesn't care about his brother, doesn't care about his church family. He didn't give a rip about anybody. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says that when he literally spent it all, I mean, he lost everything. He found himself in the pig pen. And here's what the scripture says. Put my verse up there, please. Uh, I think it's in Luke 15, 17. It says, when he finally, everybody say, when he finally. When he finally came to his what? Senses. When he finally came to his what? Truth. He said to himself. He said to who? Himself. We have to build an altar of truth. At home, even hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. If you read the whole story, he's in the pig pen. The pigs wouldn't even give him food. It was, it was a bad situation. But isn't that amazing that you and I can always create an altar of comeback? And we know that he came back to the father. And the father was always waiting for his return. Every single day, he looked out for him, and you know the story. He comes back, dad's happy, throws a big old party, puts the, the ring of, 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 of you know, uh, sonship on him, puts a, a, a robe of, of just honor on him, just bless. And the poison brother, in the, the one who was always obedient, or supposedly the one who was always for the dad, 
not really. <laughs> the one who was there always acting like he was like, yes, daddy. Uh, but deep down in his heart, he was very bitter. And then he finally confronts his dad. How dare you? How dare you throw him a party? And then you kill the best calf? He spent all your money? That's like the religious people talk. Be careful. Here we're trying to reach souls globally. And then sometimes people will come and say things about our church and be like, and you do all that? It's like, you bitter. Here's some honey, you know. And, and it's true. I mean, it, it's global. It's, it's a global epidemic. It really is. People get funny. And, uh, and, 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 and notice this kid was someone who grew honoring his dad respecting his dad, right? Or, or maybe not. And, and I'm saying this because I think some of us need to reflect our own heart and ask ourselves, I wonder if I've built an altar, an altar of truth and really have asked myself, you know what, why, why, why do I even serve God? Is there a, did I forget my why? Does it matter that I'm a follower? Does it matter that, that I get, it's a privilege to serve Jesus, it's a privilege to be able to come to a church where our doors open. We're the only church on Wednesday night that opens in Santa Clarita. Do you realize that we're privileged to do that? Like we don't have to do that. That's more work for us. But we get to do this because we want people to come to a house. Not that other churches don't care. I'm not saying that, okay? Please don't, don't misinterpret. But I'm saying for Elevate Church, we want a place where people can come, where they can receive where they can be encouraged, where they can have another pick-me-upper so that they can finish the week, come back on Sunday, and then get stirred up again. Amen? Amen. So, so we have to make sure that we check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. Hey, I've had some bad attitudes. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. I've been annoyed by people here. But, I got, but, but that's why it says, guard your heart with all diligence. Because out of that heart flows what? issues. So I have a responsibility now to guard my heart, check myself, and make sure that I do what I got to do to make it right. Amen? Okay, I know you guys don't have issues with anybody. I know y'all perfect. And I know it sucks because his, listen, uh, the prodigal son's altar was at a pig pen. But aren't you glad that God can take your dirt and make something holy out of it? That's a good thing right there, huh? Okay, number three, quickly, let's go. No, three. Y'all ain't listening. Build an altar. Listen, you build an altar in moments of trials. Let me talk about this. We're all going to face physical trials, family trials, marriage trials, faith trials, all kinds of trials. Everybody, you don't get away with it. So if you're facing one right now, just go like this. This looks like an opportunity for an altar. The Apostle Paul and Silas are beat, whipped. I mean, these guys were doing good. And now they're thrown into the prison. They are shackled with chains. They're in the deepest, darkest dungeon. They're about to be martyred the next day. And you know what they did with that, 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 that altar or that moment of trial? They turned it into an altar of worship. The Bible says they started singing in the prison. They just started singing and singing. Like how do you sing when you know you're innocent and they're going to martyr you tomorrow and you have the audacity in the midst of your trial to start singing? Let me tell you the power of worship. The altar of worship will break the chains of your life because the Bible says that when they began to worship, it says that heaven responded with a huge earthquake and shook, listen, literally shook the entire prison, not only broke every single chain, uh, not only broke every single uh, uh, door, prison door inside of that place, that prison cell, but broke every chain off every inmate. Your altar of worship can literally break the chains of other people's lives. Like that's the power that we have. <laughs> Say it with me, altar of worship. We got to have that kind of altar. You got to sing. You got to worship. I don't know what trial you're facing. Maybe you have a boss trial. 
a family trial, a child trial. Maybe you have a work trial, a health trial. I don't know what trial. Maybe there's someone coming against you trial. And let me tell you, this year I've had a lot of that. We had, we had a, just like one thing after another. You know, most of it, you know, was outside of the church. But it was just like, man, I'm like, man, the, when Jesus said and told, when he told Peter, the devil, the devil has asked to sniff you as wheat. But he told me, but, but he said, but don't, don't sweat it, Peter. For I have prayed that your faith, I've prayed for you that your faith won't fail you. That's what Jesus said to Peter. So it wasn't like, don't worry, <laughs> I covered you. You ain't going to go through that trial. No, he said, no, he, he, he's sniffing you. But notice that's all he can do is sniff. He didn't say Satan's going to come to hurt you. He said, he's going to come to sniff you. It's like a dog. They come and sniff you. If you're not a dog person, you get a freak. Like, oh, my God, oh, my God. Right? You, oh, they're chill. They're sniffing you. Or a dog comes up to you, and you're like, what? Get out of here. You know, I had that happen this week, and I went fishing. This bulldog came acting all crazy. I'm like, get. Just took off. His owner wasn't happy, but that's okay. He got over it. Ever say, say with me, say, Say an altar of worship. I'll never forget um, being in the hospital. My altar of worship when I was going through all the hell, 30 days of being in, 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 in uh, intensive care, critical care, and all these just different places. My altar, my place of crying was in the MRI. I was always in the MRI. Why? They're always finding something new, always. And so in that, in that MRI room, worship, you can come up here already worship team. Um, I cried, man. I probably left more tears in that MRI. It was at the West Hills Hospital. And uh, and I remember every time I went in there, I'd be in there and I would just start crying to God and be like, Lord, I ask you, asking you that you would remove this mass or that you would shrink it or God, that give me good news. And every time I came out of that MRI and went back to my room, the doctor come back and say, we found another problem. We found it. It was Nothing was changing. But how many know it's not about whether or not your circumstance changes? God cares more about whether or not you're changing in the midst of that trial. And, of course, long story short, I'm here. Praise God. God is good, right? But, but every time I walk into that hospital, every time I walk to that hospital, which every year I have to have a checkup, every year I go in for MRI scans for cancer just to make sure there's nothing growing, nothing. Every time I walk in that room, it's no longer tears. It's an altar. I go in there like, yes, Lord, I remember this. Woo, this is where you did it, right here. Yeah, and I walk out of there like, yeah, that hospital is my empty tomb. Amen? That's how you have to look at your. Okay, number four, build an altar of moments of tragedy. There's going to be moments of tragedy, altars of tragedy. Like it or not, Job is a perfect example. Job lost all his kids, ten kids in one day. Then he lost his health. He had boils all over his body. Then his friends were acting crazy with him. His wife was crazy. His wife said, curse God and die. Not a great wife, huh? Be careful who you marry. If you're married to them, just love them. Altar of love. Lost his wealth, lost his health. Lost everything. He went from being a rich man to having nothing. But look at what he said. Job said in Job 19, he said, I know that my Redeemer lives. Ever say, say that with me. My Redeemer lives. In the end, he will stand on the earth. Though my skin will be destroyed in my body, I shall see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I'll see him and he won't be a stranger to me. How my heart longs for that day. In the midst of his tragedy, He's like, man, Lord, you know what? You live. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. In any crisis, in any tragedy, my Redeemer lives. This is a whole other level of faith, isn't it? Right? There's patty cake faith, and then there's like, yeah. Yeah, my Redeemer lives. Though this skin falls apart, though this skin dies, though everything, my, one thing I know, he lives and then if you 
hear, if you know the story of Job, God gave him like, I forgot whether it was like a double or seven times more of what he had lost. So much more. So much more. Okay, next one. Ready? Um, yeah, and I get it because some of you, you've had people pass away. You've had children pass away. Maybe uh, a mom, a dad. Maybe you had a spouse. Someone passed away. It's not easy to go through that, that moment of tragedy and, and to experience all that. Tra- it's not easy. Listen, to this day, I, I still remember my emotions when I got the call that my niece was killed. It was the most horrendous moment. And you know what's, what? One thing is someone passing away because of maybe sickness, but being killed just takes it to a whole other level. The emotions, listen, I come from the streets. Let me tell you what happened. Two guys finished committing a robbery. They came out in their big old truck, lost control of their vehicle. My niece was walking peacefully on the sidewalk at 23 years old, and they ran straight into her. Do you know what? I'm going to be vulnerable. Can I be real? Without no judge, I know, I know that when you go real, when you go public, I know that you're subject to judgment. Don't judge me. But one moment, even the thought of revenge came in my head. I want to know who did this. See, that, that's, that's vulnerability. That's knowing that God can handle your mess. He can handle your attitude, your emotion. It's, there's nothing wrong with those feelings. What's wrong is what you do with them next. So I was feeling anger. Ah, I was just thinking, how am I going to find these guys? How am I going to hurt these guys? Man, I, I want, and, and, of course, my, my niece was living in Arizona at the time. Man, I'm like, I'm going to buy my ticket tonight. I'm going to find out who these jokers are. And, of course, that was all in a moment. And it all happened in, and I can still remember that altar of tragedy it was in my house I was in my office and I, I can still remember the carpet it was an ugly brown carpet and I hit my knees to the ground and I cried I cried man I wet that carpet with tears and I was yelling at God I was angry because I prayed because she only had like she, had, she was still alive for one minute and then they called me and said too late she didn't make it ah! I, I can still remember but I remember that I cried my heart out to God, but when I got up, up off my knees, I'll never, I'll, never, I'll never forget God gave me this peace that surpasses all understanding to be able to lead my family through it, lead my sister through it. It wasn't easy. And then, of course, something that's not healthy is when you don't mourn. I didn't mourn anymore because I was now being the anchor for everybody. I didn't mourn until months later, but I had to give myself that time. So it's okay to be in that place where you mourn. It's okay to get ugly. You know, just let it all out. But it's not okay when you just bottle it up. You gotta, gotta create that altar of, like God, in this tragedy, you were awesome. You, 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 you helped me. And of course, my sister's healed. My whole family's healed. Everyone, you know, after that, we went to help a few other families. My sister did of children that had passed away and she was able to be an anchor for those parents and and I can't understand it all. I We gave up the right to understand, but we told God, but we don't give up the right for you to give us the peace that surpasses all understanding. That's your job. You got to give us peace. You don't have to explain it to us, but you got to give us peace. Last one, ready? Build an altar in moments of victory. Victory. In other words, man, we've all had them. Maybe you beat cancer. Maybe you beat... Um, you know, a health issue. I don't know what you've beat, but we've all had these. We have to create altars of victory. Why? Because it remind us, it will remind us, man, if God did this for me, he can do this again. It's just, you're reminded. And think about this. Jesus is the perfect example. Jesus is taken on a cross. He is sacrifice. He's what? Sacrifice. It cost him something, his life. Sacrifice on a cross. He was beat ripped to shreds, unrecognizable. Then he was put in a tomb. But how many know that that tomb could not hold down Jesus? He was already victory. He wasn't looking for victory. He is victory. Amen? He wasn't looking. God already, God already, 
God was going to resurrect them. And you know what? Today, one thing we can learn about God altars is that when God creates altars, they're not altars for me. They're altars for them. Why? Because we today get to celebrate the greatest altar that God shared with us. And that is the shed blood of Jesus Christ on that beautiful, powerful cross. And we all get to create that as an altar. And we bow to the, to the cross in the name of Jesus. Amen.